Welcome to uh, this week's episode of The Mixtape. I'm Scott Cunningham. I'm a professor at Baylor University, and I'm the host of the podcast. This week's guest is Casey Mulligan, uh, professor at the University of Chicago's Department of Economics, um, and also had served in the 2018-2019 Council of Economic Advisors. Um, he's a um, someone that I wanted to talk to because he has a new book out uh, edited with Kevin Murphy and Julio J. Elias, uh, entitled The Economic Approach, Unpublished Writings of Gary Becker. And um, as you guys probably have heard me say a few times, um, it was reading Gary Becker's Nobel Prize speech that really inspired me to make me want to become an economist. Uh, and so I actually haven't read any Becker, though, in a long, long time. And it used to be all I read him just religiously. And so this is part of the the Becker students series. We've had people like Mike Grossman. Uh, we had John Colley uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Bob Michael, Shoshona Grossbard, um, and some others. Uh, this is part of that. And um, it was really great talking to Casey. Uh, Casey has worked in a lot of, lot of areas, uh, which is sort of typical of um, the Chicago school, as well as Becker in particular, a kind of a, who was a kind of economic imperialist that thought all of human life and uh, maybe even sometimes non-human life uh, was um, uh, something that the economist could have something to say something about. And so um, I really enjoyed this talk and I hope you will too. Uh, if you like it, please share it, um, leave a comment, uh, leave a review even. Um, and uh, I hope you uh, have a great day as you're listening to this and a great week. Well, it's a pleasure this uh, week to have on the um, podcast with me, Dr. Casey Mulligan, Dr. Mulligan, or Casey, thank you so much for being on the show. Hi, Scott. Um, so for the sake of the people that are listening um, that don't know a lot about you, can you tell us your title and the name of the firm that pays your paycheck? I get paid by the University of Chicago, where I am a professor of economics. How long have you been there? You could exaggerate a little and say it's been my only job. <laughs> uh, there were some teenage jobs and you know, some leaves of, leaves of absence, but it's it's only a slight exaggeration. Yeah, that's cool. I'm going to ask about that later. So before we get started, um, I have an icebreaker. So uh, I was wondering if um, money was no object, because maybe tomorrow you win the lottery, what things on your bucket list would you then accomplish that a lack of liquidity has always kept you from even being able to consider? Oh, I'm not sure uh, that's been a restriction, really. Yeah. Maybe, maybe have my own plane. Uh, oh, yeah? You like airplanes? Uh, well, no, just I uh, hate airports. <laughs> I like going your... places, and I don't like airports. But Yeah, so you get, we get, get you a private jet. Yeah, and then a private airport. So you sure, have... yeah, but there, there's plenty of... Uh, so, low traffic airports around once you have your own airplane you can right. get in right right cool well so where did you grow up tell me a little bit about your childhood i've always lived in illinois that's only a slight exaggeration again uh -huh. um not in chicago my uh grandparents were very proud to get out of the city of chicago yeah um into the suburban areas which were rural areas back then yeah. And I, I grew up in uh, suburban Chicago, about 40 miles west. Mm. Was that near where John Hughes was? You remember him, the filmmaker? Uh, I live straight west. I don't know where he lived, but I do know he had some movies on the north shore of Chicago. So I suppose he lived there. And I, I've barely been to the north shore, even, even at this point in my life. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so you're, what did your mom and dad do for a living? Uh, my dad was uh, at a computer company. Oh, okay. Um, 
back then they just wanted to stop working for the big corporation. They want to start any kind of company. They thought, oh, cigar company, computer company. Well, we'll do a computer. They were engineers. <laughs> oh, oh. And they uh, helped automate a lot of companies that back then were doing things, writing on the wall, a uh, lot of paper records, and they uh, you know, got them in the computer world. They were uh, doing computing on behalf of other customers? They had, you had one of these massive computers? Well, the technology evolved over time. There was a uh, point in their career where they hosted, um, but there was also a period there where the computers were you know, owned by the customer and, and then be on the customer's site. Yeah, yeah. That's what my dad did. He, uh, it was in Mississippi though, but he was a computer programmer and uh, we had a computer company and he uh, eventually lost the company. I think uh, the personal computer did creative destruction on the on the the the, the kind of job he was in. Um, did you have any siblings? Yeah, a uh, brother and a sister. Yeah. Yes. What, what kind of stuff did you like to play as a kid? Did you have any favorite games or cartoons or toys or action figures? Oh, I, you know, I played sports. Uh, I was on the basketball team for many years. Um, I was on a golf team oh. for for high school, not really younger than that. I was in baseball when I was before golfing. Yeah, yeah. So do you, it sounds like golfing uh, became your 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 main sport. Did I misread that? Yeah, I, I guess I played basketball in high school as well. Yeah, um, but. I don't play it much anymore, whereas golf you can still play yeah. until, the end, until the end, really. That's right. Was it uh, – so I guess even though your parents took you out, got ran away from Chicago, would you have been uh, – well, no, so you graduate in 93, but I guess you would have followed – you would have gotten to be there when the Bulls – early when Jordan got there, right? Did was you a, Were you a fan of the of the Bulls? Oh, yeah, we were – we were Bulls fans, and they were bad for a long time until Jordan showed up. Yeah. And my first year as a graduate student, in fact, uh, yeah, first year as a graduate student, they won uh, that first championship. Uh huh. It was a little bit scary. They were lighting fires and things. <laughs> Not the players, but the fans. The fans, sure, sure. They don't do that in the suburbs of Chicago. When the when there's wins, they, you got to go inside the city. Right. That was kind of true to the character, <laughs> true to the stereotype of how the server Nights think of the city. <laughs> that they're just <laughs> burning it down, burning the city down. Uh, uh, well, so when you were a little kid before high school, did you have any kind of role models that you looked up to, or you there was something that you wanted to be when you were older? Um. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, I read books and things. Yeah. Not sure I wanted to be those people. Uh, Jack Nicholas, I was impressed by, but I had no desire to be a pro golfer. He had a biography. One of the first golfers to have a biography, well, well done biography. Mm. Um, you know, I read things like, uh, Lee Iacocca, the, um, budget director for Ronald Reagan, mm. um, David Stockman. Was still still around, still writing, I guess. Hmm. But that that first book he had, um, the triumph of politics. You know, I enjoyed that. Greenspan, I think, released a book about about that time. Wait, so are you a high school student when you're reading this? The triumph of politics would have been in high school. Oh, um, yes. was there a point in time when books like that or politics really sort of was? Kind of bit you as a bug. I, I don't like politics that much. Period. Um, but the it was kind of an economic angle, I guess. You know, at the time, I maybe didn't approach it that way. But the because he was the budget director, in uh -huh. politics was the bad guy in the book, and uh, uh -huh. the, the good guy was the numbers. Ah, uh, okay, okay. That's the Stockman's. What you do know, you think? Reagan was running up the deficit. A, a minuscule amount by today's standards, but he was running up the deficit. Right. And uh, a lot of the numbers people were 
bothered by that. And, and he was the budget director and pushing back and he wrote a book. So what grade were you in when you were, when you would have read that? Yeah, I was in high school from 83 to 87. I can't remember if that book is an 86 book or an 84 book or somewhere in that range. That's a really substantive book for a high school kid to be into. Is that is that is there a story to that that you you were always that kind of kid? Just no, well, you know, high school. You remember people writing a book who want to sell money, and they're kind of targeting toward high school, right? If, mm. Otherwise, you're not going to sell money. Uh, you can have a wider audience if it, high school education is carries you through much of the book. And I think that's the case with that book. I had mm. a good high school education, so it was. Yeah. Yeah. That didn't hurt. Right. Right. So you weren't, you didn't like politics, but you liked you, but you like these political figures or these political actors or something that you're drawn to them. Well, I have Coca is, uh, is what he a business guy and Stockman I viewed as a numbers, you know, budget person and uh, Greenspan. Right. Chairman of the Federal Reserve. Greenspan never got elected to anything. As far as I know, uh, maybe he had a congressman before I was born. I don't, I'm not aware of any elections that he won mm. or participated in. But the running of the government, the running, like, yeah, it sounds like well, that's well, a good the, theme. The Iowa Coca I, I liked, but mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I guess I read some presidential biographies as well, although I wasn't impressed with them very much at all, like FDR. I read a number of FDR biographies. I was not impressed. I'm still not. Mm -hmm. um, Kennedy I was I thought he was a little over the president Kennedy was a little overrated he's still impressive profiles mm -hmm. of courage as well well done piece what impresses you about a president back then when you were little when you were younger well all the infidelities and everything were kind of the opposite of impressing me do what the all the infidelities, they were not oh, yeah. Yeah. all the infidelities. As people, as people, I seem like I would want to keep my distance. Yeah, but what? Which kind of presidents did did or did sort of like you know uh, you were kind of intrigued by? I uh, certainly Ronald Reagan. Yeah. Um. And the, and the founding fathers to some degree. Yeah. Well, so if I could have talked to one of your teachers in high school and I was like, well, what kind of student there's, there's a kid over there, Casey, uh, what kind of, what kind of, what kind of student is he? What do you, what do you think they would have said? Um, well, they, I know what they said to me. They said I was very good at social science. Oh. which I took offense at that. I, I thought I was good at math. Yeah. I, I wasn't terrible in math. I was the Illinois state champion in geometry. Uh-huh. Um, including beating all the kids, high school kids from the University of Chicago high school. Uh-huh. Um, but so I thought I, I was good at math, but they said social science. I wasn't even sure what social science was. <laughs> what do you think I, they were talking about? What they notice to I, make them say that? I, yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, <laughs> obviously, we had classes of that type, you know, history and and things. Um, and maybe I showed something there. Yeah, yeah. Huh. So did that plant any ideas in your head? No, I, I just laughed at them as fools <laughs> <laughs> and let it brush off. Well, so in you... a couple of years, I would be getting into that business. So, right, right, right. Well, so you end up since then, you know, you've written two books and you've read, edited this wonderful new book about Gary Becker's unpublished writings. Did you ever, if you could, if I could go back to your young self and say, Hey, you know, you're going to grow up and write books and, you know, would that have been impressive? Cause you were reading all these books. No, I did a lot of write, writing. Uh, wasn't my strong, I was stronger at math, uh -huh. but, but I, did a lot of writing, you know, I, more volume than my classmates, I would say. Yeah. You've always been a writer. Now I, I have published, um, maybe six books. Oh, six. I, I, I haven't thought the count, but I do know where it's more than two. 
Okay. I must look at the at a different my, yeah. my dissertation was a book. Right. Oh, you made uh, it into a book. Is that yeah. the one about fertility? For, it has a couple chapters about fertility. Yes. Uh -huh. Um about it's called parental priorities and economic inequality. Yeah, parent parenting. Right, right. And it's generational economics and yeah. fertility. The size of the next generation is a key thing. Oh. Um, I I wrote a book of the redistribution recession. Um, and then a kind of sequel to that um, about Obamacare. Uh-huh. Okay. So you like writing books. How come you write books? I know you write articles. Economists write articles, but you're also writing books. How come? Um, well, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. And so I, I think they go well together, both in terms of thinking and in terms of sharing it with others. Mm. They go further. You can share them with more people. It, but, but you're just doing better work, I think, when you, you're fitting it into a bigger picture. Right, right, right. And, uh, you know, journal referees and editors will rarely judge uh, submission on those grounds. How does it fit into a bigger picture of work? Um, right. They want it to stand on its own, understandably. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure you're advancing knowledge as much as if, if that's the main thing that you're doing. Mm. 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 But they don't reward you for, in terms of salaries and promotions for writing books. Uh, so, nearly as much as with articles so so there's some consumption to it for you yeah or in the longer run um right. yeah you're you're an expert when you've written a book on a subject and you're not necessarily an expert you've had one article in fact you may not even remember yeah. much about that topic if you just have one article on, on it totally totally yeah so you you graduate high school, you go to uh, Harvard. That must have been excited for a young. That must have been exciting for a young kid to get that letter of acceptance. Do you remember much about it? How it felt? You know, I, I lived in the Midwest, so I had not a concept. Uh, I had never been to the East Coast. had I'd been once to the West Coast, maybe. So it was pretty abstract. Mm. Um, my dad went to Notre Dame which is Midwest school, obviously mm -hmm. beautiful campus, many very strong things about that. Uh, and I got accepted there too. Yeah. Um, I didn't visit any campuses. I went to Notre Dame because I've been to football games with my parents, but I visited zero campuses. I picked Harvard because it was, um, I didn't know what I want to do. Apparently my, as I said, my high school teachers did, but I didn't. And I thought, well, if I go to Harvard, no matter where I land, what field, it's going to be really strong. Yeah. I remember my grandpa was, uh, my grandparents also lived in the Midwest. Um, my grandpa's like, you're not going to Notre Dame. What's wrong with you? <laughs> and he said, then he, he sat there for, I don't know, it must have been 20 minutes or an hour or something. Later in the afternoon, he says, wait a second, Harvard, isn't that where a couple of the presidents went? It's like, yeah, that's the same one. He's like, oh, okay, I, I can see that. <laughs> he, he kind of accepted that. Uh, but Notre Dame is put on a pedestal in the new year, in the Midwest, generally, and among Irish Beautiful. Americans, you know, even more. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You did, so is it was it a family event to watch Rudy, the, the movie Rudy, and sort of is that like a, a magical experience? I'm not sure I've seen that movie. But. What? You haven't seen it? Okay. All right. I'll send you a link after this is over. Uh, okay. Well, so um, uh, you get to Harvard. Well, what was it like stepping foot on the campus? You had these, what were some of those early feelings like? Oh, I had buyer's remorse <laughs> immediately. <laughs> uh, immediately had buyer's remorse. It was, first of all, it's a fairly urban campus. Um, right. 
which I, I've been to Notre Dame. Uh, my mom went to NIU and DeKalb. I've been there. Nice campus as well. But they're, you know, they're their own town. Right. You don't have city buses driving by. and um, So I didn't like the urban aspect of it. Mm. Um, and I, first thing I did when I got there was, you know, a few days before school and I, said, oh, all these Harvard people, I'm sure they're, you know, they're amazing and they're hardworking and everything. I need to find a job right away before any of them find a job. Oh. Uh, and I did. And then I realized none of them's going to be even looking for a job. <laughs> they were not hardworking in dimensions that I would work hard, which I had a job and I had, uh, took this schoolwork very seriously. I was very disappointed, uh, end up taking graduate classes. Mm. The graduate students are more my classmates as, as I look back. Mm. What was your job? What was that job you ended up getting? I worked in a hotel overnight, you know, because it didn't interfere with school. Right. Um, I did that for two or three years. And then Barrow hired me as a research assistant. Um, and then I shared a desc. You were uh, Bar Barrow's RA? Well, he had several. Okay. Um, I was the only undergrad RA at the time. Ah. Uh, and I shared a desk with some great guys, Michael Kramer. Oh, um, wow. Javier Sally Martin. He was kind of the leader. He's a little bit ahead of us. Randy Krosner. They were, the, but they were grad students. They were grad students. All my, as I said, all my close uh Associates, if you counted minutes or hours, there have been graduate students mm. after about the freshman year. Because as I said, that the undergrad classes I felt were very watered down. Mm. Mm. And I was paying, you know, I'm working at night to pay for this. And and all my classmates are trying to figure out how to make it easier. Right. I don't need that. Right, 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 right. So you cared about hard work. That's interesting. Did you in at Harvard? Did you um, sort of start gravitating towards work, labor, labor economics? Uh, no, I had. Uh, I took point eight economics classes. Some of those were at MIT. Mm -hmm. I was, I like covering all the fields and seeing, you know, what's going on in there. So I definitely was exposed to labor economics. Yeah. Um, I really felt there was something missing there. Mm. I, I, I don't, I'm not asking for my tuition back or anything. I, <laughs> I would have taken the classes again. Yeah. Um, but when I realized within a few years is they never mentioned Gary Becker and in these labor economics courses, uh, you can see how much they were missing by they, he was mentioned maybe a couple of times just to kind of curse at the man. Right. Um, for saying that competition might reduce discrimination or the effects of it. And a few things like that. Um, you know, this is in 1989 or so. Yeah. Um, win the Nobel prize they, in a couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, you know, the, Cutting edge practice of labor economics very much. You had to be trained in, in Becker. Um, yeah. They weren't tra training that. I could feel that it was missing, mm. um, but I didn't, didn't realize, you know, that Becker. Now, Barrow was uh, actually, the extent I got exposure to that would be from Barrow, but he was teaching macro. Yeah, right, right. Wait, so how, tell me the first time you have any exposure to Gary Becker. As a, you know, intellectually. Well, the, the, there's a, uh, Barrow in his course, he would, it was macro growth. So he would assign some of his papers with Becker on fertility and growth. Right. So that there was some familiarity there. And, and I talked to him a lot, you know, outside of the classroom or outside of the assigned work. Yeah. And he would tell me about that. Um, and, you know, Beryl was in Chicago as, I believe, associate or assistant professor somewhere in that part of his career. And, mm -hmm. you know, knew, knew the Beckers 
very well. And so he told personal stories. So I kind of got it secondhand. Um, other than seeing, you know, as I said, the labor economist like Medoff was a labor economist at, at that time uh, at Harvard, just cursing the man. Uh, right. Not really engaging his arguments, just throwing out a conclusion and then having the whole class laugh at it. Right. right. Another problem I had with the whole approach. I mean, you engage ideas, you know, even the bad ones, if if they're compelling to enough people, you need to engage it, even right. if it is bad at, at the core. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so what was it about Becker? You know, you're an undergraduate at Harvard and he's making a big impression. He's not even your professor and you, you're in this. I wouldn't say it's a big impression, but, um, Chicago writ large, I would say was making, yeah. Uh, a big impression. Just it's long. I, I can see that. I, I can see story. that they're different. I can see that they're different, and right. Um, covering a lot of fields, but with a common toolkit. The price that, that I could that I could see. Yeah, which would be uh, largely the price theory. Yeah, yeah. The long story of it was that interesting too. Kind of going back to director. And pe people like just going back to the very, very start. I wouldn't, I wouldn't learn about them until later. I mean, Aaron Director is somebody who's trained at Harvard's probably never heard heard of him. Um, mm. Yeah, and Stigler uh, was was he still alive when you end up at Chicago? He, yeah, I uh, I arrived in the fall of ninety one, and he died in December of ninety one. Did you get to talk to him much? And no, I carry a little bitterness against Sergeant. I mean, Sergeant was very, very nice, still nice to students. And a smart man gave some good advice, like don't read the general theory until you're 35. Now he says <laughs> 70, actually. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but he said, uh, you know, I was asking advice and he gave me advice on what to do. And he said, you know, you should take more math classes. Uh. So I, instead of taking Stigler's industrial organization course, I took uh, a partial differential occasion class that I've never used. And uh, I regret that I didn't go. Yeah. Cause you loved, it sounded like you also, you also kind of said something earlier that you sort of like to float around and, and read all the economics and take all the economics. Yeah. I wasn't that interested in our industrial organization. I had taken it in, in Harvard and, um, but Stigler was, you know, such a giant. Um, yeah. Now, none of us knew he was had his last weeks. I mean, it was mm -hmm. a sudden, he died suddenly. Oh. He wasn't a young man. 80, I would guess he's 82 or 81 or something like that. Yeah. But it was sudden. But he was still coming into the office every day. He had the course. I mean, he. Oh, he had the course. Yeah. Somebody, somebody had to finish the last lecture or two. Oh, it's sad. Um. Well, so, you know, there's only two intro cl econ classes that I feel like are famous. One is EC10 that you took, I guess. You would took it with Marty Feldstein? Yeah, that was an amazing course. Um, very, very well done. I've never seen an introductory econ course as good, including at Chicago. Really? What, what was it about how he did it? Um. He had a good personality. Um, he was very likable. He was amazing. He was famous by then, right? He had been Reagan's main economist. Mm. Um, yet he really, you could tell he valued us students who were nobodies. Right. Um, that made an impression. Uh, he's very good at economics. So and in this course, they were covering a wide range of topics. They, um, and he would have the Harvard department was pretty big then is big now. So he would have Richard Freeman come in and give a talk and he would have Jeffrey Sachs give another talk. Mm -hmm. Um, so about 40% of the lectures, you were getting a sample of a different field of economics in, in the lecture. Yeah. Um, and that was very, very cool. Uh, mm. Hmm. And the other class is the price theory class I was thinking of at Chicago. 
the the first one that you get there that one's also uh super famous that i know of what was what what was that class like you know i didn't take it what uh, you skipped you didn't have to take the price theory i i um you know as i mentioned i was taking graduate courses really for two thirds of my college career. Yeah. So I, when I applied to Chicago and got accepted, I said, just send me the reading list, whatever test you want me to pass outcome, I will pass it. Uh -huh. I'm going to move on to my dissertation right away. Oh, and so I did pass those tests. Um, I decided, well, I want to take some of these classes. So I did spend the first year taking classes, but not first year classes. Mm. Um, I would go into price theory when I was a faculty. Oh, did you teach price theory? No, I would be a oh, student. Oh, you were a faculty, you would go. Got it. Also, I did that with Heckman's course, which is about the right age to take his course. He he covers a lot, which is very time efficient for an assistant professor. Right. Um, you could get a whole lot in a few hours from from Jim. So you got to take Keynes when you're 70 and you got to take Heckman when you're 30. <laughs> something like that? Yeah, something like that. <laughs> okay. So um, so you went to Chicago and you were laser focused. You already knew what your dissertation was going to be about before you even got there? Nope. Uh, well, I thought I was going to have an economic growth dissertation. Oh, My right. My plan was, yeah, I was young, but... You know, when you're young, like the week before Christmas seems really long. Time seems really slow. And to me, like four years of graduate school seemed like an eternity. I could not imagine. <laughs> and so my my view is, well, I should be able to do this in a year. <laughs> I get there. I write a dissertation. A year is plenty of time. Right. I'll do it on economic growth. That was what I was working on with Barrow. I took very many classes of my classes were around economic growth. Yeah. I'll do that. Be done. When I got there, I realized I decided, well, no, I'm going to, I'm going to throw that out the window. It's very popular at the time, economic growth, but um, I want to pick a topic, any topic in the world. I don't care what it is at the intersection of some three great advisors. And so my advisors mm. were Stokey and Lucas and Becker. Mm. So that, intergenerational um, economics, if you will, yeah. was at the intersection of a lot of what they did. I did not see time. you in the back of this book, though. I was looking at 93 dissertations, and I didn't see you as one of Becker's students. Did I miss it? Um, I believe those are only ones where he was the chair of the committee. Oh, yeah, that's the chair. Got it. Okay. And I don't believe he was the chair of my committee or of, he definitely wasn't the chair of my committee. That was Stokey. And he was not the chair even of Murphy's committee. Mm. I believe that might've been Rosa. Okay. That was before my time, but we, we, we had some discussion when we were preparing the book about that. And the problem is we couldn't get it a rigorous data set of all the ones committees he was on. Mm. The chairman was something we could do in a rigorous way and not miss any. Yeah. Right. Right. Ah, oh, that's reassuring. David Mustard was my advisor or he was on my committee. And uh, for basically about 16, 17 years, I told myself Gary Becker was my grandfather. And then your book came out. And then I thought I felt like how, you know, I was like realized I was oh, I'm adopted. He's not really my grandfather. And that because mustard wasn't mentioned in there, but now maybe, maybe he's. He gets, I believe I believe that uh, I was on mustard's committee and Becker. Okay, right. good. Uh, We're, I'm back in the family. Definitely, Becker was. Uh, I, I can remember mustard's thesis proposal and Becker being there, and I would be in there. Oh, okay. Wait, so wait uh, a second. Okay, you're you're uh, mustard's advisor. No, I was on the committee. I believe on the committee. I, I yeah. definitely was at the thesis proposal, which is the main event that you have with the committee. Okay. Um, okay. So we're related a little bit. Yes. <laughs> That's right. I knew you looked familiar. Um, okay. So, so you, you end up choosing those three 
And so what, what was the, um, how did the, the idea of what was the dissertation and how did that kind of, uh, form out of, out of actually finding the advisors first? If I understood you correctly. Yeah, I found the advisors first, no doubt about that. Um, you know, it's hard to get into ranking people and everything, but I thought they were the very top on the faculty. Um, at the time, writing dissertation with Lars Hansen was very popular. Mm. Um, basically, EMR equal one very many dissertations around that. It was very popular. Um, and so Lars was probably the top dissertation advisor. And I took a number of his classes and I, and I really liked them, mm. but I didn't see the point of fighting with the other students who so badly wanted to be uh, advised by him. Mm. So I, I didn't go in that direction. Uh, but Otherwise, but, you know, after after Hanson, I would say that they were, they were very top advisors and and different, um, and I felt that was important. How are they I, different? How are they complementary, and how are they different? Well, one would be the micro versus macro. Stokey and Lucas would be more macro. Not that they're incapable. In fact, Nancy has some. I believe I, I you would call my old papers and yeah, more game theoretic. Um, she has public finance papers. Um, whereas Becker doesn't, I'm not sure he has any public finance papers that we didn't put in that new book, but um, obviously he was interested in that. Mm -hmm. um, and then he, you know, he was emphasizing the human capital element. Although Bob in the 80s was writing human capital papers too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're very good ones. So you've got this labor side and you got this macro side in the dissertation. Yeah, that, that feels kind of, I would that that feels like that stuck with you. That you you yes. sort of have yes. you, you, that you're that kind of. There's not a lot of labor economists. I feel like that that um, that are these kind of macro labor economists. I don't feel like they're as common. Is that is that wrong? Just yeah, I mean, it depends how you define that boundary. There's this search boundary there, um, which I've never delved into. Uh, yeah. Not never as illustrating. I have one paper on that regard. But, um, you know, thinking from an aggregate point of view, yeah, um, something I'm comfortable with, I think it's incredibly important for issues like incidents. I don't see how you can possibly understand the incidents of, various policies around the labor market without having the macro point of view, you know, they right. understanding where the growth comes from, where the productivity comes from. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you, uh, you, you mentioned the, the, the students fighting for a, a professor and that, and that kind of made me think, how would you have described Chicago's competitiveness between its students when you were there? Was it? I, I, no, I don't mean to make it nasty. I mean, just, it was just Lars Hansen's time was a scarce resource. He's yeah. very generous with it. Uh, and he had the most students, but still it was a scarce resource. And, you know, why, why crowd out, you know, somebody who really is going to pursue a finance career. So, uh, you know, I kind of backed off of that. Still right. take the classes where there wasn't really a capacity issue. Right. 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 Well, you know, you're known for so many. Okay. So I guess I'll save a little bit of my back. Well, no, no, here we go. So, um, uh, this third paper on your Vita on the endogenous determination of time preference with Becker. Uh, so before we even dive into it, can you tell me a little bit what it was like to have him as a co-author on a project? Cause I think you have, you have more than one, you have at least two, right? Yeah, I mean, we did a number of projects together, um, at least five or six. I have to check the V to see which ones got published. Uh huh. You know, that one was, I mean, we both hit on the same thing at the same time. Um, I was 
he was thinking about endogenous preferences, hadn't really written anything yet. Yeah. He had an approach that he wanted to use, which is compliments. But he and Murphy had worked a lot on compliments. And that approach is the one that he was going to take to preferences. Mm. I, I didn't understand any of that at the time. I was interested in the rate of time preference rate of altruism. My paper was about the generational part. Mm. And I just kind of stumbled on the compliments piece by accident, maybe imitating Yuzawa a little bit, who had a an endogenous discount factor in a infinite horizon type of model. Mm. Um, and I wrote that as my term paper in Becker's class. And, and I said, yeah, this is the first chapter of my dissertation. He said, oh, that's really good. And, you know, why don't you take a look at this thing I'm doing about the life cycle? Why don't we join forces? And, he said that this is when yeah. you were a student. How'd that feel? Um, you know, I, I think I was a student. I was a student for two years. So it was, what's the year on that prime time purpose paper? 97. Might've been right after I graduated. Uh -huh. Um, it probably was. I mean, when I, when I was doing the dissertation, the job market, there was not any time for, uh, an additional paper. So it might have been 94 when we started that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You graduated 94? 93. 93? Yeah. It did seem like on the Vita, it looked, it looked, yeah, it looked like it was later. So, uh, well, wh why did the, I'm just kind of curious, why does the, why did you feel like time preference needed to be endogenous? What was wrong with what was wrong with the in your mind at the time the views that were more common about time preference? Well, um, really, the dynamics of inequality. Mm. And it, remember, I'm beginning with the generational element, um, which has a, well, many analytical similarities with the life cycle element, but maybe the economics are different. And, you know, you, you see kind of a stable cross-sectional distribution. Um, you see regression of the mean across groups. Mm -hmm. um, but if you just have a constant discount factor, then the patient ones, if ever a patient one emerges, kind of gets all the resources. Mm -hmm. So you get an unstable distribution. Now people had ways they tried to explain that with some kind of borrowing constraints and stuff like that. Yeah. I, I, I didn't really think, I thought those were exaggerated. Uh, um, they were, they're natural places to consider, but they're not the whole story. And, and at the time you were starting to see studies coming out that were maybe suggesting the capital constraints are not the reason why um, you know, human capital investments are maybe different than efficient, if you will. So, right. Um, came at it from that point of view. Also, in the time preference stuff, I can't remember. You know, Becker. I think Becker came at it from the theoretical point of view, endogenizing preferences with complements. But I know we discuss it a lot in the paper, and we, pretty early on say, well, what's the dynamics of inequality over the life cycle? And it actually had been a JP paper about the time by D uh, Paxson and Deaton, where they showed that inequality, consumption inequality, and, and other types of inequality grow over the life cycle. If you follow the high school class, they get farther and farther apart from each other, in oh. logs even. Wow. And so that kind of suggests that, well, well, one way to explain that would say, well, there's some that are more patient and future oriented and others that aren't even within the same graduating class. So that kind of is like conditions on the education element. Yeah. The observable education level. I see. And you're watching diverging consumption. Yeah. Wow. And so that gets, so what, so you see that kind of thing that let's just say that piece of information and what do you conclude? You're, you're concluding that, education may not be the result may not be the driving force of 
of uh, inequality? Well, it, you know, it may be a big factor, but explaining it, you may want to understand about attitudes about toward the future. Right, right. And attitudes toward children. Both of those would be important. I mean, for the student, the attitude toward the future would be incredibly important. And, you know, especially at the younger ages, the education investments, the parents have a big role in mm. you know, how much are they willing to sacrifice. And we, neither Becker and I were thought it was necessary to treat it as a constant. And we weren't, didn't feel like you need to be like an econometrician to treat it as just some heterogeneity that comes from heaven. I mean, it's an outcome of a market process. Outcome or a market process. Maybe a, so. maybe a non-market process. I mean, oh, non-market process. I, I mean, uh, you know, the, when we say markets in Chicago, we mean broadly speaking, a marriage market would be a market, yeah. even though there's no Chicago Board of Trade for marriage certificates. But, right, um, right. It, it, it's a process, um, equilibrium, maybe I should say equilibrium process. Uh, and it's not just some distribution of preference parameters that are fixed. Mm. That's interesting. So altruism, uh, I think about as, you know, a willingness to, you know, a willingness to sacrifice for your child, love your child and discount rates. I usually just think of it as a person's own mind, not a person's mind with respect to other parties. But it sounds like you're, you're linking time preferencing to parenting. Well, no, no, uh, no, I'm not. Uh, oh, you're not. Analytics okay. is similar. You have consumption oh. now, consumption later. It, consumption later could be a different generation or your own self and your later in your life cycle. So uh -huh. there, there's the analytical similarity. But when it comes to education, especially at younger ages, there's both the parents and the student are involved. And the preference parameter that'll be important for the student's behavior would could be um, his attitude toward the future. Yeah. And preference parameter the important from the parents' point of view is well, how much they're willing to sacrifice. I think an example I use in my dissertation, a lot of people use immigrants. People come here, parents can't speak English, they're not earning a lot of money. Uh, but the tiny little amount of money they have, they're put into their kids' education. Yeah, yeah. So this, another thing that you've always been, I think, known for, and I just am curious a little bit, um, is this idea of voluntary unemployment. Is that right? Am I, am I misrepresenting it? Well, I didn't invent it, but <laughs> yeah, I'm very glad if I'm, I'm known for it. I mean, I have, it's a Chicago tradition that I, carry on with much enthusiasm mm -hmm. to view every market uh, from a supply and demand lens, including the labor market, which is yeah. not a trivial market. It's right. a very, very big, important market. Yeah. And I think the supply and demand framework is uh, works very well for explaining what happens and for understanding you know, how policies will affect things. Yeah. So, uh, it is the mechanism in these models it, more than, um, at some margin, there is a person who at the intensive or extensive margin is just willing to not work because they are being paid some price, um, above that you know, next best alternative. What are some of the more comp? I mean, that that's what I've, that's what I would have thought it was is some, somehow. Well, you've kind uh, of described the supply side, that, which yeah. is fine. Um, you know, you, you see somebody who's not working. Yeah. You could say, well, they're not willing to work at the wage that they can get. Mm -hmm. I could also say that employers aren't willing to hire them. <laughs> right. At the wage that that person would require. It makes yeah. it two-sided. Uh, employment is a marriage. Uh, it's a matching. It's whatever. Mm -hmm. you, they both get credit or blame for the matches that happen or don't happen. Right. But that's funny. So un because unemployment, I unemployment insurance 
you know, a lot of people say, well, it discourages people from going back to work, but you can also blame the employers who are not willing to outbid unemployment insurance. Sure. But they only will pay up to the uh, value of the marginal product. Well, so they both got their own reasons. <laughs> they all, both have their own reasons. Okay. But I would. it's funny, though, if I saw a, a, a person who was romantically single that wants to be in a relationship, I wouldn't say they're voluntarily single. Although I guess you could say they are voluntarily single because there's plenty of people that they might be able to match with and they've just written those people off. Is that kind of the idea? Yeah. I mean, uh, that's right. I mean, it's a two-sided. It's a two-sided thing. I mean, They're, they're going to say, say if it's a lady, she's going to say, well, the, the men around here, are just not good enough. Right, right, right. Um, and you could say, well, you're, you set the bark on a, yeah. not that you made a mistake, but I mean, it, it's, a, you can't lay the blame on one side of it. Hmm. So this idea, was it, did in your career, uh, was it controversial to people at all in a way that it was not historically in the Chicago tradition? Did you notice uh, well, more pushback than it like your, your ancestors had gotten? A little bit at Chicago, outside of Chicago. Um, you know, in the 2008 uh, crisis, you want to call it that, you know, employment went down quite a bit um, mm -hmm. later in 2008 and throughout early 2009. Mm -hmm. And I remember I gave a talk January, might have been 6th, 5th, something like that, 2009 in Chicago. I was saying, you know, I, I think there are, uh, there's a bigger wedge now between supply price and demand price of labor. And that's an important factor. And I remember it was at Chicago. It was only Chicago people um, there. And some people laughed out loud. Really? Um, because you I, said I there was that. a wedge between supply and demand? Between yeah, the wedges? I mean, it, it, if you were reading the New York Times, remember, it's a scary time. A lot of people watching the news. You know, are we going to get our paychecks? A lot of fear. Uh, I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying that. Right, we're just trying to ask you to remember what it was like. Yeah. And they, they felt that there, well, there has to be some kind of demand problem here. Mm. And to blame it on anything else, supply or a wedge in between demand and supply is laughable and and they and they laughed mm. a few, a few mm. people i mean it wasn't the whole room and uh, not even half the room but they were was that surprising do you thought that was weird i was a, i was a little bit surprised i was learning at the time that supply and demand for the labor market maybe for other things too was kind of being abandoned abandoned mm -hmm. it's i mean it's old it goes back to marshall yeah um, and I'm like, wow, this is awesome property and everyone's abandoning it. I would be glad to stake it out as my own. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Gobble up all the supply and demands. Sell it back later. Um, huh. Yeah. Why do you think that was happening in Chicago, though? I would think that would be... They would that wasn't be the norm at Chicago, but there were a few at Chicago. I mean, uh. We have a lot of people in Chicago who aren't trained in Chicago. Right. Who haven't, who haven't taken price theory. Maybe don't even know what's in that course. They figure it's just like a uh, Halvarian. Right. Something like that. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, so uh, I found, um, well, I, I, we don't have a lot of time. So I want to talk a little bit about your time at the CEA. So you go to the CEA in 2018, 2019. How did that how did that happen? Who 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 reached out to who, and how did you get? How, how did you end up there? Um. Well, Tom Phillipson, who was who wrote papers with Becker and was close with Becker and and me. I mean, we were co all colleagues together for uh, more than twenty years prior to that. Yeah. And Phillipson was there. He uh, he was involved a little bit in the campaign. Um, but Phillipson was on the staff there, the senior, uh, fairly senior staff, more or less from the beginning. Um, 
And so I was helping out informally from the beginning. Mm. Um, Cudlow was a friend of mine from before. Um, but Hassett was the one who reached out. And he, he when he decided that I uh, would be helpful there, then that made a big difference. Well, so and I was not I was not in a big hurry. I wasn't like calling up and complaining like how come you people haven't called me and for inviting me to the inauguration stuff. I wasn't too interested. I thought that you know Trump was elected because he's an outsider, and I, I I'm fine with that. The American people wanted that. That's what they got. But the problem with that is the outsiders don't know what they're doing. I mean, they haven't been there before, right? And so I felt that they needed a time to just to get familiar with how to run how to run the government they were outsiders right um, right and so after a year when they had practice and got up to speed then it was perfect time to jump in and you know trump had the machine running at maximum rpms by then so uh how would you explain to someone who's only been a professor what that for what that year was like they don't. They can't comprehend. You know. They only know being an economist means, you know, being a, a faculty member. Well, I, a lot of what I did is very similar to what I do at Chicago. Uh -huh. Policy analysis, and we were doing proving some theorems and things like that. Mm. Um, I discussed this. I have a book about this called "You're Hired," but it, so it was very similar. I had to wear a suit. I never wear a suit on campus or maybe for a funeral or something, but I don't, you had to wear a suit every day. Mm -hmm. um, it was a lot more fast paced. Um, and he had a lot of employees. Now, some, some of my colleagues also have a lot of employees. I don't have employees really, um, but I had a lot of, you have a lot of employees. So those are some differences. Now the Trump administration was different, I think, in being, we were doing a lot of research, um, mm -hmm. very much like we do at home. Also, Chicago is a little different than, it's very applied in what it does. Um, even those of us who are engaged in theory are very applied. Yeah. So it was a fairly small gap. You know, we were studying uh, pandemic emergency policy in 2018. Mm. At that time, that is research in every sense of the word, right? There wasn't any urgent call from the president like, I need results on pandemic emergency next week. Um, this was something that we thought was basic science that needed to be done, and we were doing it. Yeah. I, I think of Philipson having a, a long career in uh, economic ep epidemiology. Yeah. I don't know, but, we, that was one reason we got into that. That was He's one of the few specialists of that type. Right. Um, so, so you guys get there, there's not an ongoing program on pandemic research that's happening within the, by amongst the economists within no, the White No way, no way, no, huh. not even close. You look at the economic reports of the president, which is what CEA produces every year by law. Yeah. They never mentioned uh, pandemics. They never mentioned opioids and never mentioned drug overdose. The kind of things that we were doing the basic research on uh, were... Totally new. Huh. Why to was that? You... To the econ teams. Now, there are, of course, there were people at CDC, you know, right. doctors and epidemiologists working on that in a wrong way, I would say, because there's economics free, but they were, you had that, but not on the econ teams. I, I, I worked this out in my book. I, I, I show the word counts. You know, how many times is the word drug overdose mentioned in 40 mm. something economic reports of the president? Or 50 something. No, 70 something. And the answer is zero. Wow. We had a whole chapter about it. You know, and uh, the previous CAs had not even a paragraph. What do you think that what was different? Well, that's, just, that's the Chicago approach again. We don't, we've never viewed the boundaries as being, well, economics um, is just about financial markets or corporations. You know, it's about the family, it's about, addictions it's about preferences yeah. right right um, so you were it's your approach and also it's an imperial we're imperialist you know becker was an imperialist right 
uh, economic imperialist. And we were imperials. And when we got to the White House, we were so the CEA we, were, was... we were sticking our nose in all kinds of subjects where economists hadn't stuck their nose in, in, uh, in the White House realm. Right. So it's so the so y'all CEA really was kind of like a a, a Beckerian. Uh, you say you called it Chicago more generally, though, but yeah. but Beckerian CEA was kind of that. That's a that's a way to frame it. That wouldn't be wrong. Oh, very much. I, I frame it that way in huh. the book. Wow. You, know, you look at the pictures of a decon team with Trump. I could circle, you know, who were the Chicago people, and there's a there was a number of them. Wow. Uh, the oldest being uh, Richard Burkhauser, yeah, a student from the seventies. Uh huh. Um, and then the youngest being, uh, I believe, a uh, recent undergrad at U Chicago. Hmm. And then hmm. all kind of ages in between. So there were yeah. a lot of. We weren't the majority, of course. No one school's the majority, but. It was very Chicago intensive. Wow. Well, so this new book is really exciting for anybody that, that, you know, I, I was an English major in college and had never taken any econ or math in college. I took a pre-cal class in college and quit going to it. And so um, I got a job as a qualitative researcher uh, when I graduated and I, was reading um, social science stuff, sociology. I ended up at the University of Chicago Law and Economics Working Paper Series, the John M. Mullen Working Paper Series, and um, to kind of teach myself more social scientific method. I ended up reading Becker's Nobel Prize speech. So that was like um, 99 or 2000 probably. And I remember thinking... Uh, I'll never be happy if I don't become an economist. And um, and then I read um, David Mustard and John Lott's uh, Concealed Carry paper. And uh, I thought, well, then I'll just go to Georgia to study with Mustard because, uh, you know, that also made a big impression on me and he was a Becker student. And so my, my graduate career, um, I ultimately became uh, an empiricist, but it wasn't really, you know, we didn't have like a price theory kind of option, but I was sort of like you a little bit. I just took every class that was offered. So I have fields and IO and, uh, and public and econometrics. But um, I, the idea that you guys found a bunch of unpublished writings, it was, has been really exciting. And I was just curious um, what this, what's the story of of you and Dr. Murphy and Dr. Um, Elias finding uh, these 30 or so uh, chapters? You know, it's probably not right to describe it as finding. Um, we knew uh, Becker, a lot of people, also myself, Lucas, I know, was like this. Uh, you know, have problems that you think, are well suited to your skill set. And in Becker's case, he thought these are problems economics can really make good progress on. Um, and you get started and you're like, not quite cracking the nut here. I, I know it can be cracked, but I'm not quite doing it. I'll put it aside. Mm. And you come back every couple of years or a conversation brings you back and you got these, you know, things cycling around in the bullpen and, right. um, Becker had those, and we knew it because he would talk about them and, mm. you know, encourage younger people to work on them. Um, now, you know, I, if you'd interviewed me, you know, two years before he died and asked to make a exhaustive list, that, that would have been harder. And, you know, we went in his files to do that. But a number of these he talked with us about. Was there one in particular? I know you got you guys all are going to have different preferences, but – or was there one of these in particular you think that this one surprised you by how interesting it was? Um, well, the military one, well, I don't know if I was surprised. <laughs> the military one I think is very interesting and Becker talked about it a lot. Uh -huh. um, he had grappled in the 50s with the question of volunteer versus conscripted and military manpower policy. Yeah. 
and he he put it aside and he thought well you know but the politics are too overwhelming here we have a draft and that's what we're always going to have yeah um and he really regretted not following the economics to his conclusion and being an amateur political scientist and making that assessment and he always advised us not to do that yeah um i ended up making the same mistake a couple times myself uh, i recognized it as a repeatable mistake but it's uh so i know he really liked that work and, and i liked it too i've worked on the military manpower as well i had the luxury of doing it after it was clear that the united states doesn't have to have conscription it can have an all-volunteer force mm-hmm 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 well, has the was the process of writing this book was it pretty exciting? I mean, was it was it was it something that was pretty meaningful? Yeah, uh, definitely. And we were all close with Becker, and so you know, you wonder would he want people to see this? You yeah. know, what do you fill in? Um, you know, we grappled with those kind of issues, um, but ultimately, as we said in there, we knew that he wanted people to economists to work on these things and thinks that there's really room for progress that he didn't make, but it's still ripe territory, even if he didn't find exactly where to till it. Right. Right. Uh, so I'm going to ask you a, a, a question. Uh, is this a cigarette in his hand or is this chalk? On it's the a chalk. I don't think he ever smoked. Oh, he didn't um, smoke. Oh man. Uh, okay. Well, I lost that bet. Um, uh, okay. Bob Lucas smoked in class, even when I was a student. Yeah, that's what, that's what I heard. I heard that. Yeah, I think Card told me that in an interview. He said he just would he would smoke and then put out. He would light the next one, and the and he said it was just nonstop. Um. Okay, so we're gonna wrap it up. It's the top of the hour. Um. Well, let me ask you this. Actually, before I do, we. How do you think the profession is collectively different without Becker being here as a as sort of a a, the, a leader? How would you say that we're different as a as a tribe, in your opinion? Well, one thing that comes to my mind would be the direct influence and all the Chicago PhDs sitting out there. I mean, our training. It's clearly different. You can see oh, there have been all kinds of surveys that have measured, you know, comparing our alumni to other alumni. I mean, our training, our different training is obviously different. Mm -hmm. Becker was driving that since 1973 um, to the present. You know, there was a price theory before. There was uh, Viner. If you go way back, there was Milton Friedman. But, uh, you know, Milton Friedman, Viner was that long ago and Friedman left the campus in 76, you know, how long would a price theory have last lasted right. without Becker? Um, and it's not just the person being there to make it, it had to be progressed. Yeah. If we were frozen in Milton Friedman price theory, even if Becker was there willing to teach the class, I mean, people wouldn't have taken it, wouldn't have had the influence on them, but Becker kept pushing it ahead. Mm. Um, both in the scope dimension the, that he's known for, the imperialist you know, dimension. Uh, also, you know, his emphasis on compliments, which hadn't been well treated before, and that had a lot of dividends as an analytical set of analytical tools. That, that The addiction, addiction's a scope progress, but also it's an analytical progress, paying attention to compliments over time. Mm. The advertising that he did with Becker, the, uh, with Murphy, the um, social economics he did with Murphy, those are all using a developing a compliments as a, as a form of analysis. Right. 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 And, and so with him gone, it's just, even with Kevin Murphy and you there, are you teaching the price theory class at all? Murphy does all the lectures. Uh, I do some kind of bonus lectures on Fridays and I do the homeworks mm. and we have, we have a Chicago price theory book. Um, first edition's already been out a few years and then uh, we're working on a second edition it has several new chapters that I 
uh, authored. And again, we're trying to push it ahead uh, beyond what uh, the type of stuff that was ar around when Becker was teaching it. Yeah, yeah. And you feel like it's, I mean, I know it's hard to to follow in his, sho in his shoes and everything, but you feel like it's, it's, uh, it's, it's the, it is still that center of gravity at Chicago the way it once was. I mean, the course, yeah. Uh, you know, Murphy, we have videos with Chicago price .com. We have not just the book, but videos to go with the book. Uh -huh. Murphy's given most of the videos. Becker gives some. I feel guilty a lot that I allowed that to happen because anyone to have their video next to Murphy is not fair to that, uh, that person. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Beckert is not a he's he was a great lecturer. I loved his classes, but Murphy's another league ahead of really Beckert. everyone else is a teacher. Murphy um, really li likes teaching. Um he's invested in it, human capital. Yeah. Um he also has a lot of raw talent as well. And so yeah. he's a very, very good teacher. Yeah. And starting two days from now on Wednesday, he's gonna teach another another quarter of Price theory. Yeah. Um, well, you have had an exciting, productive, and very unique career, even for uh, a Chicago economist who are always very productive and very unique economists. But um, I'd love to ask you this kind of odd question. So if, you know, one day your, your old self, you know, as a young man, maybe that uh, student who's at maybe at Chicago or Harvard, uh, comes to your door through time travel and he says, uh, Hey, I only have five minutes. Um, what do you think I am unnecessarily concerned with right now? What do you think are the really important things? What do you think are the really unimportant things right now about being an economist? And he, what, what might you say to him? I'm not sure I have a magic bullet. I mean, there definitely are trade-offs. Um, there are trade-offs, and I've wondered whether I've managed the trade-off in the right direction. But by the very nature, when you're at a trade-off, kind of doesn't matter. You're near where the cost balance the benefits. So, right, you may go, you may go a little bit more in one direction or the other. But it, in the end of the day, it's not going to make a big difference if you were kind of near the optimum. Mm. Uh, but there are certainly are trade-offs. You know, like we mentioned in books versus articles, you know, how much do you play to kind of the current fads versus the longer term things? Uh, paying toward the fads has a payoff in the short term and short term, yeah. there's discounting, right? So it, did you feel matters. those trade offs when you became an economist or was it sort of like, uh, you know, like this is the only thing I want to do? Well, yeah, within the field, you, you see those trade-offs all, all the time. All the time in the field, yeah. yeah. Not being an economist, but the kind of economist to be. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Great, great. Well, it's top of the hour, uh, or a little bit over. I really appreciate you giving me your time and, and hearing a little bit of your story. And this book, I'm super excited that you guys were able to, to, bring, it, to bring it into existence. Thank you, Scott. That's fine. Okay. Bye, Casey. I see you soon.